How are you feeling today, Paul? I'm feeling pretty good. And you? Mm, I'm good. Do you have any particular feelings and emotions you want to share? Well. Are you having a happy day, a sad day, mad day? Let me check in. Mm. I'm having a glad day. A glad day. I'm so glad. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I totally just felt like a mom there. Uh, like I was like, how was your day, <laughs> honey? Was it good? Uh, What'd you do? Yeah. Okay. Uh, In this episode, we are exploring the topic of emotional buoyancy and how our feelings can be messengers that can be helpful for us in understanding ourselves, understanding the world around us. But oftentimes in our culture, we get so stuck on them and turn them into stories that uh, become our identities at times. Yeah, and I also think about in religious circles too, like there's sometimes just a certain spectrum of emotions that are acceptable. Mm. And how- Like being sweet and nice. That's it, yeah. that's it. And and how, sad. How do we embrace the fullness of our emotions because we were in fact created this way. And so part of the, I think the beauty of this conversation was asking Richard and hearing his take on What's our right relationship to emotions? What does it mean to have healthy detachment? What does it mean to fully feel our feelings and take them as messengers and not as an entire storyline? Yeah, I don't know if you feel this way, Paul, but I I feel that, I just said feel, that so much of our culture has become entirely uh, supportive of being self-referential when it comes to our feelings to the point where it's just like, I mean, what kind of... How do you get beyond that? I mean, if if your feelings rule the day and your opinions rule the day, it's very difficult to find an objective kind of ground on which we can begin to connect. I don't even know if that made sense. Yeah, you mean like a, the lens which you with which you view reality is through your feelings. So everything exactly. is a projection of your own feeling, and right. therefore you are that centerpiece of reality. Yeah, yeah. And so as we explore how contemplation can help us have a right relationship to our feelings and to orient ourselves to a selfhood that is beneath the uh, ebb and flow of our emotions. We're also talking about how to have a stance of forgiveness for ourselves and each other and just allowing ourselves to be human, allowing the human experience to be what it is. I love that line that Richard has where that the only perfection available to us is the honest acceptance of our imperfection. Mm -hmm. I find that so helpful. Also, I thought that... um, as parents, it was fun to discuss the ways in which our kids pull us out of our emotions Mm. and how, you know, even as we're teaching them how to deal with their emotions, they're also teaching us and showing us uh, patience and giving us opportunities to do it better next time. I also love how our kids are mirroring back to us our own emotions. They're learning from us how to deal with their emotions. And so this also is the invitation to be grounded in our own sense of relationship to our emotional life because it has a greater impact than just ourselves. But what we bring to our little people in our life. That's right. Well, with that, I hope you enjoy our episode on emotional buoyancy. Well, it's good to be in this room with all of you again. Um, this morning, as we talk about emotions and the spectrum of emotions that we experience on our, our human journey, Um, You know, one thing that we've learned is that emotions can be beautiful messengers. They can help us make sense of the reality of all of life, of the joy, the sorrow, when boundaries have been violated, and so on. And on the other hand, a person can fall inside of an emotion, where it's almost like the emotion seems to own who they are. This all goes to say, Richard, how do you understand how one should relate to their own emotional life on their human journey? You know, this is one of those questions where we have to say both a strong yes and a strong no. First of all, yes, because so many of us uh, were trained basically by family and religion to not feel our feelings. They thought they were doing us a favor. They really did, I think, because they didn't want emotions to rule our life. But unfortunately, they gave a, um, a moral connotation to the feeling. That's wrong, that's bad. Both family and religion. Maybe family earned it from religion. I don't know, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it it really stunted us in our capacity to appreciate and to uh, suffer. And let me explain suffer in a moment. The meaning of reality. 
because emotions are first of all a gift from God so that we can touch upon reality in a way other than our brain. Uh, and so because they were so repressed uh, and denied and thought to be always faulty, uh, that's probably one of the major reasons we moved into this overly heady Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're rediscovering, now I know this has the danger of swinging the pendulum to the other side, that emotions are always right, emotions are always good, emotions don't have to have any cognitive balancing of, is that a sensible hmm. response? Is that a reasonable response? Is that a comparable response to the situation? So we have a lot of sentimentality, drama, uh, the pumping up of emotions about nothing, <laughs> uh, really. Uh, it became a whole sitcom called Seinfeld. <laughs> 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 and I watched it and laughed at it. Uh, uh, but uh, if real life is that way, that we spend hours um, really creating dramas, mm -hmm because there is no inner drama, if I can put it that mm -hmm. way. There's no inner aliveness. There's in, no inner contentment. And that's pretty evenly equated. You can recognize when people who have no inner life will get overly dramatic about, and you just wanna, you wanna say, but you can't because it's unkind, you want to say, cool it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not that big a deal. But here's why it is a big deal, is that it's tied to the false self where most people are living their lives. Mm -hmm. And inside that frame of the ego, of the small self, it is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Now, the old phrase we used to use, in the light of eternity, the Latin phrase would, was subspatie eternitatis. Uh, uh, and the nuns would say to us, when you're on your death, deathbed, will that matter? Now that seems silly to me, but it wasn't entirely. Because it reframed the drama you're in right now. When you're on your deathbed, <laughs> I know most of us can't leap forward to that, but will this really matter? that she bumped you in the hallway, or what, which is something a little fourth grade four would get upset at. <laughs> what do you mean, Richard? I gazed <laughs> toward a certain person to my right. I'm sure you didn't. <laughs> no, I did very much. But that's the funny thing is that, you know, left unchecked, our egos oh, wow. take our emotions and turn them into these storylines mm -hmm. right. that we just get so hooked on. So, and identified with. Yeah. 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 And once you replay the story uh, more than once, it actually becomes your truth. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, if I can say so, our head of state, the lies he tells, have probably been told in his brain so many times I'm going to give him the credit that he probably thinks it's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to a lesser degree, with lesser influence, we all do the same thing. We tell ourselves a story through our emotions that we prefer to be true, and it's always self-referential. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's always, how does it make me right now feel. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you want to say, well, you even feel that way an hour from now or by this evening. But if you live uh, totally in a self-referential world, your emotions tend to control your life. Now, in its wor worst state, it becomes mental and emotional illness. Mm -hmm. It's so self-referential that there's no contact with other people's needs, with reality, with, uh, there's no capacity for empathy, mm. what someone else might be feeling. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's frightening how true this is today. And I, I really appreciate how you 
address the the symptom of of that when the diagnosis is it's the lack of inner life that creates the drama exteriorly. I wonder if you can go even further with that as far yeah. you know how we project or see the world through that emotion, and we're almost projecting on, on like a movie screen on yeah. the world around us and interpreting through just that lens. And just because I, I mean, I'd never thought about it. There's no internal drama. There's no yeah. There's nothing exciting or satisfying happening in your soul. That phrase uh, from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Go to your inner room and shut the door. Why would he go so far as to say, stop the outer noise? Because really, and now we're into Rene Girard, the only reason you're feeling that so much is that is the current cultural drama. Mm -hmm. Uh, He calls it mimetic rivalry, as you know, Mm -hmm. that we desire things that other people are desiring. That's why the cultural mood keeps changing, changing. Or basically, we feel what we know will sell, what's, what's plausible, not what's really ha- what's plausible. Like right now, uh, pre- playing the victim is so plausible that everybody's doing it. Mm. And you cannot critique it. It's an unquestionable storyline that, okay, I can't disagree with his feelings, like uh, not truth or logic or reality. These aren't paramount. His private feelings are paramount. This, you could say, forgive me if now I'm being overdramatic, but this is the destruction of culture Mm -hmm. because everything is individual there's nothing shared that's true. It's only my drama versus your drama mm-hmm. and, and your ability to articulate it. So the one with the loudest voice, the most articulate voice wins. Mm-hmm. I saw this happen even in the 70s in the, the whole massive, beautiful prayer movement. Uh, every parish was having its, its prayer group and which seems so holy and so right. But even inside of the prayer groups, the uh, person who could shout God language the loudest or quote scripture the loudest controlled the whole group. That wasn't always the case. Often there were truly holy people who you felt, you know, God might have gotten into her brain. But more often than not, it was... It was the most articulate person with high control needs. Mm. And that's why what was a big deal in the early 70s was already massively dying by the late 70s. That's how short-lived it was. Because wow. I would say for all the gift of the baptism in the spirit and the charismatic movement, emotions controlled the prayer meeting. Mm-hmm. And if you did, couldn't build up positive emotions, there was always someone there with a prophecy of doom. The Spirit is not among us today because some of you are in sin. Well, we're all in sin. You know, it just got so stupid. So, and it wasn't always that way. There were so many that were so God-bound, uh, bound for God, I mean. Mm -hmm. Uh, But most of them uh, seem to be bound up in emotions. Mm -hmm. And so we started in 77 in San Antonio. I and Father George Montagu started the um, Catholic Charismatic Bible School. It went for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I went down there every summer and taught and it was to trying to give Catholics who did have this authentic Jesus experience some kind of uh, critical approach to Scripture. Because mm. we knew if we didn't bring the head into the heart, or the heart into the head, put it either way, this was going to crash like everything else did. This is 
reminding me of, of, again, of the ways that there's been this thread in our conversation during this season about holding things in tension yeah. with each other. And I'm thinking about, you know, in, in the evangelical tradition, how so much of our spirituality is equated with a certain kind of feelingness, yeah. feeling God, feeling connected to God. You know, it was placed at the level of feeling. So when you weren't having that sensation or feeling, you didn't have God. You, yeah. So yeah. you lived with this well, this kind of uh, uh, hamster wheel panic of trying to keep yes, up this this yes. feeling, this kind of emotional high that would often get uh, somewhat um, prodded, poked, and 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 fanned through music and the worship music. You know. And I remember people would just, you know, like the more like the, the certain chord progressions that would just make you really feel like really you were feel. just like, you know, you say <laughs> the hands come up <laughs> and you're just head back, you know, and I don't want to completely dismiss what's, no, you can't. what is beautiful about you that, can't. which is probably the closest we have to a, a mystical contemplative experience in ecstatic the evangelical experience. ecstatic. Yeah. yeah. It's just fascinating that you're saying again, you know, the head, the heart, and the body have to be in tension with one mm, another. That's right, have to balance. And mm. when we allow feelings to take over and, and become our primary narrative, you know, that we're not really living in tension with a true lens for what's going on. And I wonder, Richard, if you could talk about how your practice or how contemplative practice can help us maybe unhook with our addiction mm -hmm. to seeing the world through feelings, which can be so self-referential. I would have to say, I think it's the quickest, finally most effective way to learn how to detach, how to not identify with, even in the moment, when you're talking with an angry person who's maybe angry at you, the natural thing is for you to identify with this humiliation, the, the name this person just called me. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to, to not do that. But without some kind of practice in surrender, uh, detachment, you'll almost always go there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, it doesn't have to be our form, centering prayer, uh, contemplation, which has so many different forms, but they all have to come down to saying, that's not me. Mm. Mm. That feeling I'm having is separate from my essential I. It's a codependent relationship on what other people think, whatever other people feel, Mimetic rivalry, to use that fancy word, imitative emotion that we've seen. And this is why children, and I know you're so aware of this as parents, I mean, it's, you see it already by five and six, that they mimic the emotions they've seen you portray. How could they not? How could they not? Uh, which must be so scary. It's brutal. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm thinking of Rowan recently saying to me while I was teaching Soren how to, you know, just connect with his, his breath. And I was having a real parenting win moment. And uh, Rowan just looks at me. He goes, Mom, you know, and I think I've told this story before, but it, it, it's, it's a good it's one. It's a good one where he <laughs> says, Mom, you know what sounds you make when you're frustrated? <sighs> and <laughs> then he just perfect example. and then he just kept doing yeah. it and i was like oh man yeah. okay <laughs> it's so already much, passed over so much for Mimetic being zen. rivalry right. he's rivaling you and <laughs> outdoing it <laughs> and you know I'm, we can't say that's wrong but but what we have to do is model positive mimetic rivalry must be very hard to do mm -hmm. uh, when they know you're irritated and you can use that as a teachable moment mm -hmm. now honey I, you know I'm upset because that car cut me off <laughs> and I want to be upset but let's practice not being upset mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and there's more important things than letting negative bugaboos getting into our heart mm -hmm. and into our mind mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, we have to use for ourselves, first of all, but certainly for our families, those opportunities. Mm -hmm. I've told the stories many t the story many times. Oh, years ago, I was in New Hampshire with a French Catholic family, and uh, we all went to Mass in this little, pretty French Catholic church, and the, the priest was terrible. It was a horrible sermon and horrible liturgy, at least by my critical <laughs> evaluation, which, of course, I wasn't going to say anything. I was uh -huh. the outsider. I just sat there in the pew. And we sat down, and they had about five kids. And they said, Fa Daddy, that sucked. <laughs> that was terrible. Why do we have to go to church? And he was a very mature spiritual man. He says, everybody has a right to a bad day. Mm. Mm. I didn't yeah. like it either. It was disappointing, frankly. And I might even go and talk to Father about it, why it wasn't good. Mm. Mm. And this guy probably would. But what a teachable moment. Yeah. Mm. He didn't buy into what his wife and all his five kids were feeling. Mm -hmm. And he mm. modeled fathering, you know. Mm. Uh, it was really, I just sat there uh, aghast. I'd love to see some of those kids today. Right. If they had a dad like that. Yeah. I do think it's, you know, those moments as parents when we can have the humility to say, hey, can we, and this is something that my kids say, is, hey, can we, can we, can we hit the reset button? Mm. Can we reset our ground right now? Like things have gotten out of hand. And I don't know, Paul, if you have things that you do as well in that way that help kind of admit okay yeah I yeah i mean I, we don't i love that phrase reset button i'm going to introduce that to the family but i think <laughs> for me one i use it a lot <laughs> <laughs> i would too and i think there's something about when you not just trying to model when you when you're doing it right but when you do it wrong That's to come it. back around That's and it. say mm. sweetie boy did i just blow yes. it and yeah. i'm so sorry that Sometimes i hurt you in that way better. with those words it just I came out as I was acting out of anger instead of from a place of love. And, uh, and those moments are hard too, because you recognize you're being that vulnerable, that vulnerable before a four year old mm -hmm. who yeah. is just going to kind of soak it in and just kind of, you know, big eyes, not mm -hmm. say much, but just, not say just much, absorb it. What did daddy just do? Yeah. Our mother. Yeah. yeah. And I do feel like they, they help us mirror or they help mirror back to us that sense of, that kind of unconditional love, when we do bring that forward and say, hey, I'm so sorry I got frustrated about that. Yeah. That was just unnecessary. And I'm sorry you had to feel me get upset about the fact that I was late coming into recording the podcast today, for example. <laughs> I'm sorry I got stressed out, you know. And then just to watch them reflect back, oh, it's okay, Mama. I have bad days, too. Oh, mm, that's know? amazing. Yeah. Anyway. That's amazing. Yeah, I think I was telling you and our producer, Corey, yesterday about... I got a text from my, my wife about our daughter who her preschool teacher told Laura, my wife, that um, at preschool that day, she was talking to another four-year-old and said, yeah, our, our house is too small, but we love our neighborhood. And like a four-year-old saying this, it's, she bounces really? between being a four-year-old and a middle-aged woman. Uh -huh. And like, but it's because she's heard us say this. Of so course. she's just throwing it back in her own, trying it on with her four-year-old friends who are, I'm sure... You know, could care less that our house is too small, but we really like the neighborhood. Isn't that beautiful? But so you know you've said that. Yes. And she heard you. And she heard it. <laughs> we didn't know uh, she heard it. Give you such satisfaction. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, but, you know, as we talk about these emotions and how we connect or disconnect, um, I've been hanging out with Meister Eckhart a little bit through oh. books, uh, not through reality. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad you clarified yeah, that. Yeah. I didn't want anyone to, to think ill of me. Um, but obviously, his teaching on detachment and there's someone nuanced it for me in such a way that I found so helpful that it was more archeological rather than architectural. He wasn't trying to build more space in life, but trying to uncover what's already there. Oh. And that just like Clever flipped a switch for me. Yeah. Okay, okay. So I'm wondering, Richard, can you speak to, to us about detachment, particularly in light of the vow or value of simplicity that we've been circling around this season? It's wonderful if we can make that connection. I think if I did it at all, it's taken me a long time to do it. But that, blessed are the poor in spirit, the first beatitude of Jesus. 
I think talks about uh, my spirit not being righteous, overly self-assured, rich in its certitudes. Uh, we've touched on this already in this series, but it, it's worth repeating. Um, that it's not just we apply everything to material externals. Mm -hmm. How about interior internals? Uh, that I can, uh, poverty of thought, poverty of emotion, uh, tamp them down. I don't have to say the clever thing. You've heard me say in years past, uh, I really feel sorry for little kids who are introverts or maybe, frankly, not as bright or not as quick. When the character of uh, high school, or not high school, grade school, conversation is clever put-downs. Mm -hmm. Just clever put-downs one after the other. How helpless, how stupid, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, a kid who's slow must feel by the time they're out of grade school. Mm -hmm. the, the kids who win are the kids who are extroverted, mm -hmm. quick, mm -hmm. and dramatic, and frankly, obscene. Which is why we've moved toward this more and more common usage of four-letter words. Mm -hmm. That puts the person for some reason in charge. I'd love to know the logic of that. Mm -hmm. But you throw out hell and you've got a new control in the group. Uh, and we've all done it. Not me, because I, <laughs> I, I, I'm saint. obedient to my mother who yeah. said yeah. never use it. Uh -huh. When she heard me use shit on a, a early cassette, she called me up from Kansas. Ooh. Now Dickie, I told you never to use that word. <laughs> and she was dead serious. Uh -huh. Anyway, uh, you know, uh, Eckhart went so far as to say, I'm sure you know this, detachment, detachment, detachment. And when you first hear it, it says, oh, well, that's an overstatement. Mm. But do you see how it all relies on the existence of the true self? If you can peel away all the, you know, pomp and circumstance, mm -hmm. the, the true stel self stands revealed. And he had to have experienced that. It's just about detachment. Now, I don't totally agree with him, however, because I do believe it's about passion for the good mm -hmm. and not just detachment from the bad. But his further writings show that he understood that too. Mm. Maybe that's what you mean by archaeological being the detaching, architectural being the well, it's passionate all, building, or what? Well, the way that I w it was landing for me was that, you know, when, when some folks talk about becoming more simple, they create space. I want to be more simple by doing this. Let me build oh, this well, outside yes. of my life instead of removing or uncovering space, uh, letting go of things. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm certainly connected to what you said. I think part of my own, the way I'm made up as a human being, it's actually very easy for me to detach from a lot of things. Yes. But there's ways where that's also just um, emotional bypassing, where I mm. don't want to feel that, that, that mm. difficult feeling. And so part of my own detachment practice is actually having to feel those things before I let them go. Otherwise, I'm just stuffing them or I'm... I think that's so important. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Well, very true. And you're speaking, everybody, as a nine. Yeah. So any of you who are nines know that that's almost their problem. They mm -hmm. detach yeah. too readily mm -hmm. and give way to what everybody else wants them to yeah. think. Yeah, I wake up with like a blank slate. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. If I had a really hard day the day before, I often would wake up and all those hard emotions aren't... I'm not hooked to them, mm -hmm. which it can be my own tragedy that I need to wrestle with. I think it's, it's, it's difficult for us to let go of what we haven't first clung to or welcomed. Yeah. And I think this is a growing edge, even in our contemplative circles of not making detachment, this um, rejection of, mm -hmm. or pushing away of, but to first softly welcome the experience, the feeling, the thought, whatever it is. And then, to really allow it in to see, you know, 
I feel like it must have been during the living school that one of you as faculty talked about detachment isn't an absence of passion or an absence of feeling. It's just the capacity to let the passion and the feelings run through and not get hooked on them. It's the capacity to know there's this ground underneath it, which I think is is really valuable and I'm glad you brought that up. Mm -hmm. Another name for everything will continue in a moment. So many bad movements occur by overstatement and everybody getting on their high horse and stirring the worst instincts in mm. a crowd mm-hmm. in other people. Uh, I don't know how you change that in a culture, mm. but unless you do, you just don't have rationality or civility. Mm-hmm. And we're coming rather close to that. For all the weaknesses of the 40s and 50s, we weren't nearly that way, nearly... Yeah, and I think that's it's so valuable for us to consider and be aware of to have the vision for where we are being stirred up and Uh, what sentiment or feeling is being stirred up within us, not just at a personal level, mm -hmm. but at a cultural level, you know, with all the rallies that are happening, for instance to be aware of, well, what is it rallying? What is it rallying? (laughs) What emotion is this actually trying to tap into? Is it fear? Is Mm. it um, hysteria? Is it, you know, um, so I I don't know. I think your perspective there, Richard, on having a cultural awareness of the role of feelings and how it's pushing us into certain kinds of actions Uh, or behavior is really important. I mean, it is giving demagogues and not so smart people, a lot of power they don't deserve. Mm. Because there's no free individual. There's no, I'm not talking about individualism, but a person who can resist mob psychology, Mm -hmm. who can resist the loud voice, or the clever put down, or the four letter word. Mm. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking that, on a humorous note, I mean, growing up in Minnesota, there's like what I would call like a Zen Minnesotan mindset at times when it comes to weather, where it's like, you know, the, the seasons are so harsh and distinct that there's always a live in conversation. Well, this will pass. Something else will come new. Mm-hmm. So no one ever kind of like gets too mm-hmm. caught up in what's, mm-hmm. what's the current state of the weather and to use that as a metaphor. Because like, this will pass. Because this will pass. It turns well, out you're not a nine. You're just from Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Minnesota nice. <laughs> well, um, he, I think, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but there's a story of Thomas Keating that I really love on guilt where someone comes to him and says something about how they've been feeling guilty about something they've done for weeks and weeks and weeks. And Thomas says, um, guilt only lasts a number of minutes. This is, I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing here, but sure. guilt only lasts the number of minutes it takes for you to recognize that you've misstepped. The rest isn't guilt. It's your own neuroses, wow. <laughs> which I, I, I love that story. And mm. it's so helpful. And one of the things I'm wondering, Richard, is what is in your opinion, the role of conscience in our actions, um, and our feelings? Let me say, first of all, that I don't think we trained our people in um, Catholic or Protestant in the development of conscience because they would need the clergy less. (laughs) We really didn't want them. We won't admit that. But it's the first rule in Catholic moral theology, but you don't hear priests saying it very much. Mm. You must follow your conscience. That's the first. The second rule is, and it's fair enough, but you must form your conscience. Mm. Uh, Why was that so seldom taught? Uh, Why didn't we see us as, as helping people form their conscience? Building on what we said yesterday, experience scripture tradition. We spiritual bypass. 
Well, it's much easier just to let Father or the pastor or the minister be your conscience. Mm -hmm. And we created a very infantile Christianity because of that. I'm going to look for a quote. I think it's in Romans. Uh, Paul can edit this if I take too much time. Sword drill. <laughs> what did you say? Sword drill. The, oh, oh. It, it's the Bible game. That yeah. Sword drill. We should have three Bibles See, in here so that we can all try that. so you can find it first. Who gets to Romans first yeah. to get this reference? <laughs> Where to get the it? sticker some, on your some chart. Some Baptist who's listening right now already has it. Uh, already is. <laughs> well, I bet they would, don't. Uh, be, <laughs> yes. It, it's one of the few times, if maybe the only time, it's Romans 2, uh, chapters, I mean, verses. It is not listening to the law, verse 13. It is not listening to the law, but keeping it that will make people holy in the sight of God. Praxis over belief. For instance, pagans who never heard of the law, but are led by their reason to do what the law commands, may not actually possess the law the way we Jews do, he's saying, but they can be said to be the law. Oh, do you feel the danger in that? Mm -hmm. huh? They can point to the substance of the law engraved on their hearts. They can call a witness. That is, and there's the word, their own conscience. The, the inner conversation of accusation and defense. Their own manner, inner mental dialogue. That's wow. genius. Wow. Yeah, that's genius. Romans 2, 13 to 15. They can call a witness. That is their own conscience. Uh, this interplay of accusation and defense. I call it pitch and catch, where you throw out to God and you wait for a response uh, sent back. Their own inner mental dialogue. I wonder how many Christians have had that passage pointed out to right. them. Yeah. Um, because it, it felt like um, giving the individual too much power. Mm. Now I call it, as you know, inner authority. And I admit fully, inner authority has to be balanced by Scripture, tradition, not just experience. But with people who can do that, you always see them come to calm, uh, reflective, prayerful answers. Mm. Uh, i, I got to admit it. I, in the Catholic Church, I've often seen it in nuns who are spiritual directors and Jesuits. Hmm. Mm. who get this training and discernment. Uh, the, you know, for years, the only Catholic magazine I read was America, which is because if you wanted a, a civil, well-thought-out response to a contemporary situation, you went to the Jesuit magazine. Mm -hmm. you know? It wasn't right. It wasn't left. It was free to critique the right and critique the left. It was just so refreshing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was like some kind of station in between Fox News and MSNBC uh, based on intelligence. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Richard, would, where would you put community in the balance of ah. tradition, experience, and scriptures, particularly as it pertains to discernment and mirroring mm, you know, our own edges of growth? Let's define community as something other than just a group. I just named two forms of community. Your spiritual director, your, your Jesuit parish. Uh, there have to be some connections. Your marriage. Family. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Some truth speakers who have authority in your life beyond you. Who can say, honey, I... You're filled with yourself right now. Uh, <laughs> cool it, you know. <laughs> it's never oh. quite that polite, actually. But. Uh, so um, let, let's, 
Let's define community the way Jesus seemed to have first done. Two or three gathered in my name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when many people think of community, it's the big institutional group or the Sunday morning parish, which really you have little real accountability to. Mm -hmm. But these smaller twos and threes, Mm -hmm. friends, marriage, director, therapist, people who learn how to listen to them and give them authority in their life can talk sensibly, which we desperately need in our society. So would that form part of the larger T tradition for us? Or is that part of our, would that be part of the experience bucket when you describe? It would be experience critiqued and it would be tradition uh, uh, open to tradition. Mm open to people who know no, more about what the response might be than I do mm-hmm. from other the humility teachers, to, yeah. uh, uh, saints, mystics. Uh, we Catholics always had a little saint's quote to pull out. Mm. That was tradition, you know, yeah. Mm. And I was thinking about when that true community forms, for me, in those, it is often in those twos and threes, and usually yes. outside of the yes. walls of an institution too. Um, that I find myself asking questions that I'm afraid to ask alone. Yeah. But if I feel the safety in that group yes. of two or three, I know that I'm on sacred ground, and that vulnerability will lead us to even a deeper sense of communion, even though I'm on the edge of myself or what I think I I might know or not know. Mm-hmm. I also find it's with the two and threes that you can make yourself vulnerable to being mirrored back Mm. and where you're Mm. needing to grow or where your growing edges really are to say, you know, here's what I'm struggling with or even in the process of discernment, what do you see in me? Mm. What are you noticing that I'm having a hard time seeing, which is so valuable. Yeah, I remember at Creighton with one of my Jesuit professors in a class on discernment, was him, uh, the professor getting after us because we weren't laying all of our cards out on the table. We weren't being transparent <laughs> enough with ourselves to discern. He's like, how are you going to discern if you're not in touch with where you're actually at? Yeah. And you're not laying it all out there so you know which, you know, which, uh, which pieces of value and which pieces actually harming you. Um, and I think that's part of it too. It's, it's only in that that uh, that safety where you, you can be mirrored in such a way that you can be free to put all your cards on the table. Mm. So I do want to thank the Jesuits for that that yeah. that toolbox. Um, so Richard, I do think that you know that emotions are somewhat suspect in certain religious circles, almost yeah. as if we can't admit yeah. that Jesus felt deep grief and mm-hmm. and passion and joy and, and and camaraderie. How have you seen your own emotional life? change from being a young friar to where you are now in a more embodied way? How have you seen that emotional life shift? You know, one of the worst effects, and I'm not saying they were all bad effects, of celibacy and a worldview where obedience was idealized almost as the highest virtue is that it taught you quite early, starting, I mean, I got started at 14, (laughs) when you're having these huge swings of emotion, and it probably uh, was good that there was some training in boundering them. But being trained so early in, in celibacy and obedience, what you got was a PhD in repression. Mm-hmm. Not trusting them, not allowing them, not listening to them, which I think created a lot of unhealthy men in the long run, who, uh, who had a rather uh, superficial inner life because they didn't know how to feel the love of God deeply e- either, or they didn't know how to feel the pain of the poor deeply either. There was a lack of empathy, sympathy. They didn't even know it, that mm-hmm. they had it. Um, it uh, so, but you're asking about me. I, I, what I, I guess what I'm saying is I was one of those because mm. you had to to succeed at this game. 
And yet it wasn't all a game. It did give me a boundaried self. It did give me a sense of self. It also gave me a sense of righteousness. So if, if unconditional love hadn't have broken through in my novitiate year when I was 18, 19, I think I would have become a real curmudgeon. Because mm -hmm. uh, I, was, I was rather successful at the first task. Do you understand? Uh -huh. I was good at repression. I was good at boundary making. I was good at saying no to myself. And it would have been what was an advantage maybe from 14 to 17 uh, to make me grow up a little bit, would have started becoming uh, sick. And thank God the 60s came and I had some wonderful professors that uh, and some wonderful human uh, growth classes, workshops, mm -hmm. all in the early 60s, such a marvelous time. So little by little, uh, I was given permission to feel my feelings, to make mistakes, to uh, recognize my feelings were not the only feelings, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a big part of it that another person who's also a Franciscan and a good person can have different feelings about the same thing. All of that teaches you the way of love without you even realizing it. And that, that pretty much was the name of the game in the 60s. And why by 1968, more nuns and priests left than any other year in recorded history. Mm. The, the thing had so blown open and people who had utterly repressed. Now, I think, to be honest, I think some made a mistake. <laughs> they probably shouldn't have left. Mm. But it was so exciting to finally feel your feelings. <laughs> uh, and I don't mean just sexual ones. Yeah. I just mean anger about issues of abuse or, mm. or misunderstanding or or their father wounds, or their mother wounds, all those kind of things. We, overnight, were given massive permission and vocabulary mm -hmm. um, to feel those things and to talk about those things in small groups. Now, I think our seminary was somewhat unusual mm -hmm. in having those kind of workshops. And even during that period, a lot left in our school. It's, it's a huge risk because it does, your, your inner life now becomes a tyrant. It can be, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it dominated your, your experience. Why wasn't I allowed to think this mm -hmm. or feel this? Now it becomes the only thing mm -hmm. I can think or feel. You see this... I saw it in my nieces after their first feminist class in college, you know, and you can't take it away from them. They have to know that. But there is a bigger picture than just that, uh, what men did to women. It's also what people did to people, mm -hmm. and people did to blacks and browns and gays and everybody else. But you don't have enough empathy yet to broaden it. To, mm. uh, so for at least six months, women are the most oppressed people in the world. And you must integrate that because it's partially true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's white girls in America have the freedom to, to study that. <laughs> and the black girl in Africa doesn't even know that. So even that little piece of knowledge mm -hmm. might give her a little patience with it. Let's make sure the black women of Africa can also be liberated. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that makes me think about the ways in which <clears throat> having a practiced stance, inner stance of forgiveness, seems to be crucial in allowing the emotional life to not be the only lens by which we yes, see that's reality. What I'm so, that inner stance of forgiveness, could you talk to us, Richard, about how forgiveness practiced for both self, for ourselves, and for each other? Um, personally and collectively, is somewhat of a sacrament of personal and universal resurrection. Mm. 
I've said it for years, so I know it, it's repetitious for some listeners. But I, I've gone so far, and I think I still believe that in a certain sense, the capacity to forgive, to give it and to receive it, might just be the whole gospel. Mm-hmm. And I'm willing to allow that to be an overstatement even, to make people struggle with it. Uh, to let go ahead of time, to forgive, mm-hmm. to give yourself beforehand um, to the person, to the situation, uh, despite whatever facts have just been revealed. That demands a tremendous generosity of spirit that frankly is the mind of Christ, the the sacred heart, Mm -hmm. the mind of God. It's, It's not what the little self can do. The little self cannot forgive. It just can't. It's too stingy. It's still boundering itself. It's still creating itself. And in the early stages of creating yourself, you do it by, uh, at least one of the quickest ways to do it, is by uh, taking offense, victimhood, what was done unto me that was wrong or unfair. And you have to do that, but when it becomes your identity is what was done to you, not who are you in God Mm -hmm. from the moment of your conception. but because we in the church haven't taught them about the true self, false self, that's almost all our culture has left. It's not who I am from all eternity and what source I can draw upon, but she did this to me. My mother did this to me. My father did this to me. And I'm not saying there isn't a place that that has to be worked through. Mm -hmm. It does. But you better have at least your finger on a deeper source, or you'll waste 10 to 15 years, Mm -hmm. and you will be so ingrained in a negative identity, an oppositional victimhood, uh, that you think it's you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of the reasons I founded the center that I recognized in so many social activists, they did not know how to act. They only knew how to react. They only knew how to be against. And when you'd ask them just to praise God, let's put it in that form, Mm. they lost all their energy. Mm. But if I can show how Ronald Reagan is an idiot, boy, they were filled with emotion. Mm. (laughs) Uh, How... Can you feel the same emotion that God is faithful? God is good. Well, yeah, I know I believe that, but let's not waste much time there. Mm. I'd rather uh, gather my energy about how wrong Ronald Reagan's nuclear buildup is. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I agree with that. But you could see in so many people, they did not know how to motivate themselves unless there was a problem. There had to be somebody, some cause, some issue to be against. And I, I want to say, I'm happy we have such fighters. <laughs> but when that's all you have is fighters, what do you do after you win the revolution? You know, <laughs> after, Ron, just to use that silly example, mm-hmm. after Ronald Reagan is no longer in office. Uh, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> Oh, thanks, Richard. And in that kind of spirit of uh, of acknowledging the necessity and the, the the ripeness of blessing, and trying to cultivate a sense of that, and not just hold the reaction and and the the speaking truth to power. I wonder if you could end with a reflection on Philippians four here. This came to mind when when Bree and I were in conversation. Uh, and uh, we, we frantically looked it up on our phones instead of our Bibles because we didn't have them with us. But um, it was just speaking to us as a way to, to end this. So I'm just going to read it here. Hmm. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, 
whatever is gracious. Yes. If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And I think in some of the other translations, it's dwell, mm-hmm. dwell in such dwell. things. Dwell, yes. Oh. Which Isn't is helpful. That, now, of course, I believe that Paul was a fellow one like me. Mm. And we are most inclined to the opposite, to what's bad, what's wrong, what's stupid. <laughs> And I've been to Philippi and the little hovel that they, they know for certain was the jail. You, you just stand there looking at it. And you say, to think he wrote that while being enchained in this dirty little ugly spot uh, or within 10 feet of it. Um, he's magnificently overcoming his temptation to oneness, Mm. to resentment. No, you must dwell on the positive. That's not just the naive power of positive thinking. Mm -hmm. It's drawing your your source uh, from God instead of problem-centeredness. Where I've seen this most consistently, and they're dying off, I must admit, in my whole lifetime, is old nuns, so many old nuns. Just how did they learn that? I don't know, but probably because they were women in the church and seldom got their way. They had to, you know, dwell on what was positive, what was good. And Mm -hmm. they would name their orders, you know, Sisters of Divine Providence. Uh, uh, How good is the good God, blessed Julie Billard. They all had mottos that were calling their followers to a a positive stance. It didn't have the the intense social justice uh, concern, but really it did. uh, You know, like Mother Seton, live simply so others can simply live. Mm -hmm. But... uh, Uh, I think our church is really going to suffer from the lack of nuns. Mm. Uh, What I mean is women with spiritual depth and maturity proven over time, you know. It wasn't just the knee-jerk reaction. And we still see it in the social justice world, network and such things, nuns on the bus, (laughs) that these women who've spent years reflecting on the gospel uh, have an authority in our church that usually, especially now, outweighs the priests and the bishops. Mm. And it invariably comes to a positive place. If it doesn't, they don't have authority. If it's just whining and complaining, whining is not <laughs> spiritual authority. It really isn't. Mm. It evokes a, um, yeah. A low-level response. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of that maxim that I think Cynthia says, where she says, energy flows where attention goes. Yeah, that's a good line. That if we can cultivate the spirit of what is true, what is is honorable, what is just, what is pure, Mm, lovely. So good. To to orient ourselves, uh, to exercise that as a muscle, Mm -hmm. to turn in that direction Mm. inwardly, um, that feels like a great invitation for us today, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's the heart of contemplation to appreciate. Mm. Mm. To appreciate little things. And to retrain the mind to know how to do that. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Well, should we look at some listener questions? Let's do it. Okay. Emotional buoyancy. Buoyancy. (laughs) Let's see, let's see what we got here. I don't remember. My question is, what are some good reasons for staying in a religion? And what are some not so good reasons? And on the flip side, what are some good reasons for leaving a religion? And what are some not so good reasons? I find myself deep in the throes of the disorder stage with the church I was raised in, the Mormon church. And I find myself obsessing over this question. Because at this point, both leaving and staying feel equally impossible to me. And I'm having a hard time trusting my motives. 
I fear that if I leave, it will just be out of anger, which might be a stage. And I fear that if I stay, it will just, it's just out of fear of other people's reactions and losing the community and my family and friends. So if you could speak to some good reasons for leaving and staying, I would appreciate it. Thank you. You know, I would suggest that we can't solve this problem on the personal level because we just feel guilty or uh, heroic. It, it, it uh, appeals too much to the personal voices of shame or, or a wonderfulness. I'm trying to address this in a new little monograph I wrote called uh, What Do We Do With Evil? And if you have time or interest, it's less than 100 pages. I hate to push my own books. But uh, I think you've got to address this collectively. Some good reasons to stay is not just because it's meeting your needs all, all the time, it has to some of the time, or you're nuts for staying, you know? But collectively, what is the existence of my church doing for history, for society, for the other world religions, for uh, people on the street, for the least of the brothers and sisters? And then you'll be able to come to clarity rather quickly. And it isn't so much about you. Oh, my church isn't feeding me. You know, don't limit it to <coughs> that lowest dome of meeting that we call my story. Did I teach that here? No. No, that was, I think, the Falling Upward course. That's the falling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never know where I said what, but uh, in two of my books, I have a diagram of three domes, each one encompassing the smaller one. My story, then the second dome is our story, and then the third dome enclosing the other two is the story. Now religion is supposed to be pointing to the story. The liberal likes to make everything psychological language of my story, my feelings, my needs, what am I doing? And so the conservative tends to get trapped in our story, uh, belonging to a tribe and conformity to the rules of the tribe, and very often allows no uh, journeys into the clarification of my story. Little self-knowledge is needed as long as you remain a good Roman Catholic. Um, uh, so until those bottom two are respected, the story, the great gospel, the perennial tradition, doesn't have much power to change you or to change the world. So I offer you that uh, in this context. I probably should have put this in the book, Falling Upward, but I, I, I don't think it is in there. It's in... Uh, Things Hidden, I think. Things Hidden. I guess it's in that book. and The new version of Hope Against Darkness. It's going to be in that, too. Um, so look at all three domes of meaning. And don't just make your judgment on my story. Because that has allowed a whole generation of people to remain very narcissistic. They think that's the only thing that matters. Our story keeps you in tribe too long. But if you can say there is the story, uh, a meta narrative that pulls it all together, then you can respect the need for tribe and community, let's just call it that. And you can also respect the need for self-knowledge, for personal growth, but recognize any one of these Apart from the other two, this way I always end up talking, I'm afraid, but uh, ends up being not very good. Mm -hmm. Even people who think they can fly to the story with no self-knowledge and with no affiliation to any group whatsoever. Uh, these are the loners 
who do bad things yeah. in society. So I, I am answering your question, I hope. Look at what your church is doing. Is it leading human civilization forward in the ways of love and peace? Or is it just creating a tribe? If you'll allow me, and I say this in my book, Falling Upward, your own particular denomination, I, I think I say in the book, does the first half of life very well in terms of our story. You've created a beautiful collective story, but it doesn't do <laughs> the second half of life very well at all. Allowing the inner journey, at least the Mormons I've had to work with, have been allowed almost no self-knowledge or self-acceptance. So they can't deal with the negative. They have to project it elsewhere. And it remains a white, upper-class club, you know. That, that can't be the future of humanity. It isn't the future of humanity. That doesn't mean that Mormonism doesn't do several things well. But uh, I'm giving you both reasons to stay. If you're still building the, the silo of the first half of life, I'm giving you reasons to walk away with dignity if you find yourself moving into the questions of the second half of life. Mm -hmm. Sorry for the long answer. No, okay. that's good. Thanks, Richard. All right, here's our next one. Hi. My question comes from page 16 of The Universal Christ, but God loves things by becoming them. And this phrase made me very curious to know in, a, in an embodied way, in a personal way, about how God becomes through love. And in spending time with that curiosity, I came into the, um, the Greek word perikrethes, right, for circle dance, trinity, and this idea of the verb to go around um, coupled with the word for making space. And in my lived practice, I'm looking for ways to allow space to be made as well as moving into new action. And so my question for you all, all three of you would be, um, if you could point to spaces in your life where you are moving into new ways of being or how you're seeing God, um, becoming things in your life by loving them, through loving them. And I'm especially curious about this idea of emergence. In my experience, what seems to be true is that always something, something always emerges when I make space and then move into actions. Thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing from you. Creativity! <laughs> Who wants to start? I, I, I love what you're saying in this question because it's the idea that making space isn't the end point, which is as many times we think about contemplation or non-duality as an end point, as a static state. What you're saying is, no, there's dynamism, there's movement, and in the making space is a giving to. In the making room is a womb-like conception that then births something new out into the world. <coughs> And I am inspired by that. I think that's, that's the growing edge of my own practice is to, to see um, contemplation as being in service to creativity and manifesting something new in the world. I love that. I'm, I'm thinking through for myself, for my own seat. I'm, and to confess, I'm, uh, I'm exhausted. My, my, uh, my, my baby does not sleep. Um, oh, my God. Thank and you. part of that practice of creating space has been something that I learned from you, Richard, when you were talking about uh, being in pain and trying to be in solidarity with those oh, yeah. and other, and, uh, across the world, whether it's, a, you know, I think the example you gave was a, a Syrian mother. You know, what yes. was that? And so for, Syrian mothers constantly come to my mind. Yeah. So for me in the middle of the night when I'm trying to get my young one back to sleep, I try to be in solidarity with all the parents across the world who are awake at that moment. And I specifically think of those with kids with disabilities and those who so much of their work uh, of loving that, that creates space is done in secret and it's done in the middle of the night yes. and in ways that wow. the world wow. we don't know. And, uh, and so 
in, in my small way, I'm trying to create space in the small spaces I have uh, to be present to where uh, Christ is emerging in me. And through that, as you said, that, that dynamism, through that relationship with my, my son, who is uh, a sleepless, sleepless child. So it, it's, in, it's in the context of my own reality. Yeah, it's funny you'd ask this now because I think I'm definitely experiencing this. All my life, I've been pretty much a type A personality, a workaholic. And it's not formal retirement, but I just have lost all interest in traveling, in writing. I know it doesn't look like it. But <laughs> I, uh, in, in reading. I haven't read a book in months now. This is absolutely new. And these, these even exciting titles come my way. Now, I don't know if this is God telling me this is my exit time or what it is, but I just feel there's nothing I need to complexify my brain with in a book. There's no new place I've got to see. It's, it feels like laziness to this German it really feels like laziness. I take one or two naps every day. I did take three for a while, but once I started eating meat, sorry, uh, I got over some of my anemia. Uh, so I'm, I'm watching this and I'm talking to wise people about it. Uh, I don't know if this is what retirement is supposed to mean or if I finally found my nine week. <laughs> Welcome to the club. <laughs> I, uh, I am not reading. I'm only writing what the CAC tells me I need to write. And then it wants to, I can feel I'm being obedient to some <laughs> need. I guess that's my two way. <laughs> then, okay, you need a book on evil, I'll do it. But you leave me to myself right now. I'll just watch nature shows and really... And vet shows, too, mm-hmm. about these wonderful people who heal, mm-hmm. dying animals, suffering animals. Uh, and I sit there feeling, God, if these people who think I'm so heroic would, <laughs> would see me, I'm not saving anybody. Mm. Uh, I feel like I'm riding on my laurels of all the books I've already written. I've paid my dues. Now I can sit here and watch nature shows. So, <laughs> but you know what I see, Richard? I mean, maybe that's true. I mean, I don't, I don't want to discount yeah, yeah. the fact that you're like in nature show, mo- ma- nature show <laughs> mode. But I also see you as being so deeply present and available to the staff mm. in this season yeah. in a way that is so embodied and accessible and loving and kind um, that, you know, I don't, I mean, yeah, I think, I think the process of love becoming in you is still very active and we're oh, feeling I it. That's we're true. Feeling I do it. feel that. Yeah. I do. I do feel that, that I don't have to rush as much mm. as I did my whole life. Uh, it's just wonderful. Mm. But there's guilt with it. Mm. That, uh, that you're not doing what, enough. What motivated me all my life was the 10 jobs I still needed to do. Mm. And now it's down to just one or two. And I don't feel the urgency. Hmm. Very interesting Hmm. to my own psyche uh, that I don't feel that. Well, I'm glad. I hope uh, it's true that you're experiencing this as an increase in presence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just love it when people come by. Mm -hmm. They say, can I come in? Oh, yes, come by. I got nothing else to do. (laughs) And that's it for today's episode of Another Name for Everything with Richard Rohr. This podcast is produced by the Center for Action and Contemplation. Thanks to the generosity of our donors. The beautiful music you're listening to was brought to you by Will Reagan. If you're enjoying this podcast, consider rating it, writing a review, or sharing it with a friend to help create a bigger and more inclusive community. To learn more about Father Richard and to receive his free daily meditations in your electronic mailbox, visit cac.org. To learn more about the themes of the universal Christ, visit 
universalchrist.org. From the high desert of New Mexico, we wish you peace and every good.